covering last time. I've just initiated the recording uh, and uh, we'll try to post this later today. Um, but as a recollection of our uh, previous, um, previous coverage, uh, during our last session, we introduced uh, some of the, the basic dynamics associated with stocks and flows. And we spoke about um, the higher level construct uh, called a uh, first order delay in particular, um, introducing that briefly, but without um, much more than kind of intuition to, uh, to motivate it mathematically. Uh, in today's session, uh, I'm going to be uh, leading a discussion of some additional um, understanding of, of first order delays, specifically uh, focusing on their equilibrium behavior, um, commenting uh, a little bit about uh, why uh, they carry the name um, uh, that has lent them, uh, first order delays. Uh, and we'll also talk some about the, um, the numerical simulation of them and a little bit about how that works so that you're aware of what's going on under the hood as befits computer scientists. Um, within that regard, you'll also, uh, I'll also be highlighting an issue that comes in with uh, what's, uh, what's associated with the concept of numerical instability, uh, to wit how uh, injudicious choices uh, of of um, numerical integration techniques in, in judicious choices of the time step, for example, with which one goes through successively uh, computing the evolution of a system um, can, cause, uh, can cause real problems um, and uh, can even lead a stock that should retain a, a positive value, perhaps because it's it's representing a physical quantity, you know, perhaps people, or perhaps uh, numbers of vials of vaccine um, uh, not yet administered, or what have you. It can cause it to go negative, um, and uh, that is an artifact of the simulation. It's not it's not uh, something about the mathematics of the situation so much. Uh, as about the um, uh, the methods used to to, to uh, simulate the um, success of evolution of of that system behavior of those mathematics, so it's it's due to a poor approximation computationally to that mathematics. Um, but it is a very practical concern, and it's a concern that uh, you may find uh, afflicting you, um, uh, particularly if you pursue projects in this course. Um, well, as time allows, uh, we'll also be discussing uh, a little bit about the use of uh, dimensions to, to characterize um, uh, a system and, sorry, there's uh, some family distraction here for most inopportune sort, um, uh, to characterize system evolution and to, to characterize uh, the the um, consistency of different areas of the system with, the, uh, with one another. And what we'll find is that um, while models in simulation are lent values for every quantity and, and evolve based on those values, um, it's often uh, helpful to, um, to reason about a system statically, that is um, not, not in its, uh, its dynamics over time, but ahead of time, in terms of abstractions of those values, um, characterizing it in terms of its the dimensionality or the units associated with different quantities, and by so doing, we secure many of the many advantages that we may explore in more detail in some of the later lectures in this course. Uh, but amongst them, uh, the ability to spot model formulation errors, uh, the capacity to derive. Um, uh, certain relationships uh, in the model that might otherwise be obscure, uh, and uh, a capacity to, to characterize the model with fewer parameters, to actually characterize it in a, in a fashion that's at once simpler but complete. And by so doing, um, 
some of the processes we'll be examining in later lectures, things like uh, parameter estimation of through calibration or sensitivity analyses, we can we can perform those processes uh, in a fashion that's that's uh, less involved, that um, can be completed with fewer steps. And that's often easier to understand. Finally, uh, characterizing a system with these sort of dimensions can also allow for reasoning about uh, system behavior as parameters change, or for an agent-based model as the, the population size changes. Uh, for example, uh, if you have a population, an agent-based model representing a population of a million, and you want to reason about how it would uh, behave if it were lent to a population of closer to 30 million, perhaps representing the, the Canadian population as a whole, without in fact going through that um, a computationally intensive exercise. So um, today's uh, lecture will provide a kind of microcosm of a lot of key concepts that will accompany us uh, through the remainder of the course. But, but to accomplish that, we'll have to use the time well. And thus, without further ado, I'm going to uh, jump into the, um, the lecture material. I, I will note that uh, I had posted some items on the forum just before class and um, in response to some good questions that we had. And I'll be, uh, I'll be seeking after this, uh, this lecture again, as always to have office hours uh, by which I can answer more of those questions. Okay, we're getting some good questions about, uh, about the first assignment there. Okay. Um, so uh, let's let's switch over to the lecture slides here. No, you don't want to see uh, adjunctions right now. Um, that's for later courses. Uh, okay. <clears throat> so um, today's discussion, uh, as I noted, builds on uh, an understanding of the basics of stocks and flows that we've talked about in recent lectures. We actually went through the use of any logic to simulate them and hopefully lent a certain intuition for their operation. <clears throat> so stocks, as we've said, represent the state of the system. Uh, we lend them an initial value at the start of simulation, but thereafter, their evolution is dictated by the flows, the flows into them and the flows out of them. And it's specifically the net some of those flows. So some of the flows in minus some of the flows out <clears throat> that dictates the rate of change over time of that stock, how quickly it's rising and how quickly it's falling. Um, now the flows that, that are incident on a stock, the flow in or flow out <clears throat> in general depend for their evolution on the state of the system. Remember the very definition of a dynamical system, um, the systems we're characterizing with dynamic modeling, is a system whose behavior over time is dictated by the state of that system. It's not simply some fixed value, regardless of that state, and it's not simply stochastic values that you know are all over the place, regardless of of what happened last. No, it's it may be stochastic, it may be deterministic, but how it evolves over the next little bit hinges on the current state. And uh, the way that's expressed in system dynamics is the values of the flows that dictate how it's gonna evolve over the next little bit um, are determined, uh, typically deterministically, typically in a fixed way by the current state of the system. And I want to come back to a key point that may seem to the keeners amongst you to be kind of old hat or, 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 or simple stuff, trivial stuff. But it's, it's a point that um, even the most experienced modeling practitioners do well to keep in their head, to keep in their kind of short-term memory, because it can really help interpret the behavior of very complex systems, give you insights as to what's going on. And, and this has to do with the penultimate uh, bullet point in this slide, okay? Um, at any point, I noted just minutes ago, the rate of change of a stock is given by the net flow into the stock, you know, the sum of the inflows minus the sum of the outflows. But 
here's the here are the kickers. The value of the stock will therefore be rising when inflow is greater than outflow, or you know, net flow is greater than zero. Um, the sum of the inflows is greater than the sum of the outflows. You could think your bathtub, the water's pouring in faster than it's leaking. The value of that stock will be falling when inflow is less than outflow. So when the water is rushing out of the drain faster than it's coming in. And it will remain constant when the inflow is equal to the outflow. And these truths hold, keep their veracity, they hold true, even uh, for very complex models such as agent-based models. Um, or discrete event models. We may not characterize them with the language of stocks and flows. We have other building blocks there, state charts and queues and delay blocks and events and networks. But you can abstract them into your head as stocks and flows that, that sums up of the agents with a certain characteristic, for example. And these facts hold true and they will carry over and they will be extraordinarily useful for parsing out the behavior of that more complex system full of, of agents interacting to, to really probe what's going on beneath the covers. We can reason about inflows and outflows. So, so these facts, whilst they are front and center with system dynamics, they're not limited to it. And arguably um, of equal significance is the final fact. A fact of great significance as well for your assignment. A stock behaves over time by integrating, by summing up in a continuous fashion, the net flow uh, associated with it over time. So, you know, if we have a constant value coming into it, it'll sum it up into something that's just ever rising as if you know, you had a person arriving into your apartment every hour, um, they're gonna be accumulating in your apartment and uh, each successive hour go up by the same amount of one person. So we'll rise linearly, it'll rise in, in sort of a line-like fashion. Um, if the first hour you have one person, the next hour two people, and the next hour three people, and the next hour four people, it'll be actually rising quadratically. Um, it'll be, uh, It'll be rising faster and faster because more and more people are arriving each successive hour. So a stock, uh, its job is to accumulate the values of flows. Now, we looked at, at these phenomena through the lens of a first order delay in our previous time together. And I wanna give you some, um, some recollection of that, okay? Um, so I noticed my microphone is, um, is, is not quite turned towards me properly, and that may lend me a, a kind of uh, a, a very uh, a highly variegated audio. I'm going to turn it towards me, but I need someone to tell me if you could still hear it afterwards because there's a flaky connection with it. So uh, pardon me, I've, I've turned it. Can you still hear me? Yes. Okay. Very yeah, fine. Fine. Thank you. Um, Okay, so here's our first order delay. Hopefully the audio will be more, a little bit more regular. Here's our first order delay. And what distinguishes it as a first order delay is the fact that it has an inflow, that's the immigration here, it has an outflow, but the value of that outflow specifically depends linearly on the value of the population. Now, what do I mean by linear? Fancy term. What I mean is the value of the outflow is proportional to the value of the, of the stock, okay? Um, so, so let me say that again, make sure that I use the right words. The value of the outflow at any given time is proportional to the value of the stock at that time. By proportion, I mean, it's just some constant times it. And in our case, we had a mortality rate. Maybe it was 0.01. Um, and so the number of people done per day, because remember, flows are always measured per time unit per day is just 0.01 times the population. Okay, it's proportional to the population. Population doubles, the number of people dying per day will double. The population goes up by a factor of 10, 
the number of people dying per day will go up by a factor of 10. The population goes to zero, the rate of the outflow will go to zero. The, the number of people dying per day will go to zero. Um, so here we have a formula um, for death, which is alpha, this uh, mortality rate times population. And, and really it's this linear dependence of the outflow on the inflow, uh, sorry, the outflow on the stock plus the, the, uh, the occurrence of this inflow coming into the stock in addition to it, the distinguishes a first order delay. Um, and I had noted last time that first order delay contains a negative feedback associated with this. Okay, so if you kind of look from the perspective of death, there's a negative feedback. Um, the negative side of that feedback is not obvious, but remember with reason cause, reading causal loops, we kind of go around the loop. And so as population increases, deaths per day tend to increase. That's associated with a plus therefore. And then as deaths increase, deaths per day increase, the population tends to decrease, tend to be decreased. So there's actually a negative link kind of going back into the stock, which basically says death decrease population. Okay, and that's why it's a negative loop. Um, so uh, it's associated with a balancing feedback and, and that lends certain behavior on it. And particularly it drives goal seeking behavior, behavior where it, it seeks stability, it seeks equilibrium. And specifically it seeks a case where Inflow equals outflow. That's when it's in balance. That's when it's not changing. It's not going up, it's not going down. Any value above that, the outflow will be increased and so will, the outflow will be greater than the inflow and the stock will be drawn down. Value the stock less than the equilibrium, well, the inflow will be greater than the outflow and therefore the, the value of the stock will come up. It'll, and so we'll, we'll be dragged around. So it's really the surplus of inflow beyond outflow that regulates the, very, uh, the value of the stock, okay? And when I'm talking rate here, I had noted during office hours, um, three different uses of rate, the term rate in English, which are rather unhelpful to have this, this ambiguity. When I'm used, referring to rate here, I'm talking say people per day. I'm talking the, the value of a, of a flow, not, the value of the constant associated with the flow called mortality rate here, okay? Um, so uh, just be aware English has this vulnerability as it does in so many areas. Okay, um, so here's our, our formula for first order delay that characterizes it. It's associated with a value for death that's proportional to the population because alpha is fixed. It's some, some constant. Okay, um, and this lends behavior that uh, in this case is goal seeking. Here, immigration is zero. We'll see cases soon enough where it's not zero. And the value of the stock over time, the number of people in the population will, will drop, okay? And it'll drop initially very quickly. And then eventually it'll be dropping the number of, it'll be dropping slower and slower. And why is it dropping slower? Well, because deaths are occurring uh, at slower rates. Why are deaths occurring at slower rates? Because there are fewer people to die. And so there are fewer people that die per time unit. So if you look at deaths, it's completely proportional to the people in the stock. That's what I told you. First order delay is distinguished by an outflow that's proportional to the value of the stock. So it shouldn't come as a surprise that deaths is proportional to the number of people in this stock, right? It's just some multiple times it. Um, so in this case, the multiple is point, point 0.2. So uh, if the stock is a thousand, the, uh, the number of people dying per, well, in this case, it's month is, is 200, okay? Um, and as it drains, fewer and fewer people in the stock, uh, the mortality rate stays the same, but if initially there's a thousand people uh, at risk, uh, a lot more will die in the first month 
than if there's only 10 people at risk. Um, you'll still be dying at a, the same mortality rate. It's just you may have in the first month 100 people out of the 1,000 dying, whereas if you only have 10 people in it, you may have one person out of those 10 dying. Okay, same, same proportion. Okay, um, so uh, stock and flow uh, of this sort uh, associated with a first order delay is if it's goal-seeking behavior. And, um, and that's associated with its negative feedback loop. It seeks this equilibrium. This, the equilibrium being sought here is very simple. It's zero people in the stock. It's pushing to make the stock zero and it's gravitating towards it because immigration is zero. We'll see that's not always the case. And as it will remind us of our exercise last time. Okay, um, okay. So in general though, we're going to have a flow into a stock uh, that's non-zero. And we may be associated with a, a rate, people per unit time of I, okay? Um, and, and this I could be from a single flow or it could be the sum of multiple flows. I'm gonna abstract over that. Um, at, at the end, it, it doesn't really matter. It's that, that net flow in, okay? And what's gonna happen as we saw last time is the value of the stock will approach an equilibrium where inflow equals outflow. Gosh, if you remember like one thing from system dynamics, um, trying to remember this, um, uh, although I would say that idea that the stock will go up if inflow is greater than outflow, go down if, if inflow is less than outflow and be stable if they're equal, those would rank, rank equally. Uh, okay, so let's consider a first order delay of this sort, okay? Um, Let's look beyond pretty pictures and let's think about a little bit about some of the mathematics of it, okay? The outflow rate here, we treat the, the value of the stock, the here people, uh, treat, call it X, okay? Um, the, the thing that distinguishes a first order delay is that um, the, the value of the outflow is proportional to that stock, to X. So the outflow rate is alpha, some alpha times X, where alpha is some fixed constant. And you'll find me writing constants in these Greek letters, okay? Um, uh, so uh, the inflow rate will, will term in a similarly pithy fashion, a similarly terse fashion, a similarly concise fashion as I. Okay, lowercase i. Now, at equilibrium, um, as I've said, the value of the stock must be such that inflow equals outflow. So in this case, we have alpha X, that's the value of the outflow, equals the value of the inflow, which is given directly by I. So if we have that, what's the value of the stock? So that's, that's an equation between flows, right? Inflow equals outflow, or outflow equals inflow. Um, uh, a, uh, alpha X equals I. Now, what is that telling us about the value of the stock of X? Well, look, alpha is a constant, right? Um, so X is gonna be whatever the inflow is. If the inflow were a, const were a constant I, we could just divide it by this fixed value alpha to get the value of the stock at which this holds true. So if, if X holds the value, um, I over alpha, then guess what? Alpha times X will be equal to I. I mean, it's, it's basic algebra, right? Um, so if we have a fixed inflow I and assuming alpha is fixed, uh, then fixed mortality rate, for example, then the value of the stock at which it is at rest, at which it is equilibrium, at which the inflow equals the outflow, this goal, the value of this goal that it seeks is X equals I over alpha, okay? Now, this tells us something. It tells us, look, if, if we have a faster rate of um, a, a, a more chance per unit time of leaving the stock, in other words, alpha is larger, it'll tend to draw down the equilibrium point of that stock. So, 
you know, it makes sense, right? If, if people are discharged from the ICU for COVID after three weeks only, so here alpha will be, we'll get to it, but it'll be one over 21 if it's measured in, 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 um, in one over days. Um, then, then in this case, we're going to have people accumulating in the ICU very quickly even if you have one person per day coming in, they're staying 21 days. Maybe you have 10 beds in the ICU. And in 10 days, they're gonna be filled up, right? It's, people have to stay for 21 days. And that's exactly a lot of the issue with COVID-19 and, and critical patients. They have to stay for three weeks on average and uh, in the ICU. And then they need some post-ICU care and often pre-ICU care. And, and so it accumulates, even with a modest rate of flow in, you, you can fill it up. Um, so if you have, you know, uh, on the order of between 100 and 200 ICU beds in the province um, with ventilators attached, you know, you can get in trouble uh, pretty easily with even a modest rate of inflow because they have to stay so long. By contrast, if people can leave in a day from the ICU, um, then then it's not gonna, the stock is not gonna accumulate to as high a value before it reaches equilibrium, okay? So um, alternatively, viewed from the standpoint of I, the inflow, if the inflow rate is higher, if, if you know 10 people are coming into the ICU per day, the equilibrium value of that ICU uh, population when it stabilizes is gonna be a lot higher. Even if they leave in a day, it's gonna be a lot higher than if it's one person per day. So the equilibrium value of the, of, the, um, of the stock is gonna be given as I over alpha. That's the value at which the stock will be in equilibrium at which alpha X equals I, okay? Outflow equals inflow. Um, now, there's another way that we can phrase first order delays just involving constants. We're gonna, if we're lucky at the end of this lecture, we'll get to another sort of, quite interesting conceptual way to view first order delays um, that mathematically is identical, but the structure looks differently. Um, it appears different. But um, if we're just dealing with kind of phrasing of things, naming of things, of sort of our, our choice of parameters, um, it turns out we, we have a choice uh, as to how to frame as it were the um, the situation with with the outflow that is math in a way that's mathematically identical, but it's often easier to think about a certain way, and it's often easier for stakeholders to understand a certain way. We can either phrase it in terms of some rate of progression, some chance per unit time of leaving the stock, alpha, or we can phrase it in terms of a mean time in the stock, a so-called mean residence time, how long you stay in the stock which I'll call tau, okay? Um, and I'll write T at you um, because PowerPoint online is lame. Um, and uh, here uh, we will have a formulation that's mathematically identical, but it is, it is something which, uh, which uh, phrase, frames it in a way that may be more helpful. So here we have a formula for the outflow of population divided by tau, whereas before we had the formula for the outflow of alpha times population or population times alpha. So here the mean lifetime uh, is, is measured in, in as unit of time, whereas mortality rate or in general, this chance per unit time of leaving is is of unit one over one over time. Okay, so we can we can phrase things either way, and it turns out, and I have some slides later that will show mathematically. Although I won't go through the derivation uh, with with you folks here in detail, but the details are laid out for you um, for those who are interested. That the if if you have a chance per unit time uh, of alpha. The mean time in the stock, the mean residence time, how long each person spends on average in there with a single outflow is one over alpha, OK? 
okay? So if the mortality rate is 0.1, the mean time in that population stock will be 10, say, say if it's 0 0.1, so in other words, a 0 0.1 per day um, mortality rate, so 10% per day, the mean time in that stock will be 10 days, okay? If the mortality rate is 0 0.01 per day, so 1% chance per day, the mean time in that stock will be one over that, or 100 days, okay? Um, and that can be shown through, through um, a relatively simple integration exercise with integral calculus. It's a lot of fun too. Um, okay, so if we frame a stock of flow in this fashion, then we get a formulation such as that uh, given here. Instead of working in terms of alpha, um, and deriving the equilibrium value of the stock in terms of the inflow and alpha will instead be deriving it in terms of tau, okay? Um, and uh, the, the inflow rate is again denoted I here. Just as a reminder, the outflow, the formula for the outflow is X over tau. And we want inflow, we, we, we're gonna solve for the equilibri equilibrium value of the stock in terms of the inflow and in terms of this fixed parameter tau, okay? And so how do we solve for the equilibrium value of the stock? This is, this is like a great question for a final exam. Boy, would this be a good question. In fact, I think I've seen it on some final exams created by a certain instructor before. So um, it's a good thing to know. Look, we wanna solve for the equilibrium value, equilibrium value of the stock. We know that the equilibrium occurs, equilibrium occurs when the inflow equals the outflow. So it's X over tau must equal I here. Outflow equals inflow. Okay, tau and I are constants here, we'll assume. So the equilibrium value at which outflow equals inflow is X equals I times tau. Or if we had a value of X for the stock at equal to I times tau, then the outflow will be I times tau divided by tau, which will be I. And that's equal to the inflow, right? Um, now, what this tells us is, look, the longer the delay, like three weeks in the ICU rather than one day in the ICU, the larger the equilibrium value of the stock will be. The, the more people will accumulate in that ICU before it kind of balances out with a fix, even a fixed inflow. Um, if people are leaving quickly, the number of people who accumulate it will be a lot smaller. If people are, are leaving slower, so tau is very large, uh, then more people will accumulate, right? Um, okay. So systems like this not only have these equilibria, they seek it, they seek it out. They, 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 um, they gravitate towards it. That's why it's a balancing loop, a, um, this negative feedback loop. Um, it seeks stasis, it seeks stability. It seeks a situation where inflow equals outflow because if it's above it, Outflow will be bigger than inflow, draw down. And if it's the value of the stock is below that in that equilibrium value, the inflow will be bigger than the outflow and it will rise and it will reach it. Okay, but there's another point here. And that is, that comes in terms of thinking about um, an inflow to a stock. So, and it has to do with the very name of a first order delay, okay? Why is it called a first order delay? Well. Look, if we think about the inflow as kind of an input to the system, maybe the inflow is zero for 50 years and then it shoots up to 20. Um, the value of the stock during those 50 years, let's assume it's, it's initially zero, okay? Um, and then the inflow shoots up and suddenly we have the stock having inflow greater than the outflow and the stock starts to fill, right? Um, it starts to, the, the value of the stock starts to rise because the inflow is greater than the outflow. So the stock will be rising 
and it will be uh, filling up. Uh, now, initially, it'll be almost linear because the value of the stock is very low. So the outflow will be close to zero, but the inflow is large. So it'll be filling up, uh, it'll be filling up somewhat linearly. But as time goes on, the outflow is getting larger and larger as well. And so the net flow into the stock is smaller and smaller. The inflows is still the same, this value of 20 per, per year, but the value of the outflow is getting larger and larger. And so the net flow is, which determines the rate of increase in stock is getting smaller and smaller. So the stock's still rising, it's just rising slower and slower. And so if you keep on running it, it will reach equilibrium and guess what? It will reach equilibrium for the outflow. That's actually, I, I should have emphasized, I'm showing the outflow here in red. It, it is proportional to the value of the stock. So what I said about the stock is true, but this is showing the outflow of the stock and it's that which follows, which is a delayed version of the inflow. So the stock after all reaches equilibrium when inflow equals outflow. So if you look at it from the perspective of the outflow, the outflow is gonna be like the inflow, but delayed. It's gonna be trying to follow the inflow because that will get the stock to its sweet spot where inflow equals outflow. That's the balance to which the stock aspires, okay? Um, so here the outflow is following the inflow and it's following it because its value is dictated by the stock. Okay, um, now, now let's, let's consider it if we have different delays associated with that stock. So for example, um, a two year delay associated with it, tau equals two or maybe it's a 20 year associated with it. That's the red here on the opposite extreme. Uh, or maybe it's a, a, a five year, that's, the, that's the, gray, the gray curve here. All of the, in all of these cases, the outflow is following the inflow. It's going, it's initially zero and then it shoots up uh, and shoots up at different rates and it's trying to get to this rate where outflow equals inflow. Because again, if it's not on that, the stock will, will um, change. And it, well, the stock, the stock will induce a situation where it moves in the right direction. So with a short delay, that's the, the blue, the delay is quite small and you'll see the outflow follows pretty quickly after the inflow. Um, pretty quickly after year, year 50, um, and certainly overwhelmingly by year 60, that, uh, that outflow is, has mimicked uh, that rise in the inflow. By contrast, something like a 20-year delay, it's going to be adjusting and still aspiring to it after 50 years. It's getting closer and closer, but it's not there yet. Okay, so, so here we're looking at the outflow compared to the inflow when we're emphasizing how it follows the inflow, how it's a delayed version of the inflow. And we talk about it being a first order delay because there's only one stage in the process. We could have an nth order delay, which would have successive stocks kind of halfway, for example, or, or a quarter of the way, or, or you know, third of the way, three stocks, or or you know, 10 stocks uh, in a row. Um, now, the value of the, so this is the value of the, the, of, the, uh, of the flow, the outflow that's shown here. The stock will be doing something different. I mean, the stock associated with the red with a really long delay will be going to a much higher value. Remember we said the equilibrium value of a stock with high tau is much, above that with low tau. It's because the equilibrium value of the stock depends linearly on tau. So if tau is very large, the equilibrium value of the stock will be large. If tau is small, the equilibrium value of the stock will be small. But the outflow of the stock will still follow the inflow. Um, and the stock will simply rise to a much higher value to achieve that outflow. Um, for a short delay, 
the stock won't rise as high. It can, it can have the same value of that outflow um, for a, a much smaller value of the stock, okay? Um, remember that the outflow rate from, if we frame, frame the situation in terms of tau, the outflow rate for a stock is the value of the stock divided by, divided by the value of, of the delay of tau. So if tau is, is really quite large, we need a really big value of the stock to get that outflow to equal the, a given inflow, right? Um, because tau would drag it down, the outflow with x over tau. And so we have a really big value of tau. And, and so we need x to be really big to, to, to compensate for that so that their, their quotient x over tau is equal to the inflow. But if, if tau is really small, let's say it's one, right? The value of the stock doesn't have to be very big at all, just equal the value of the inflow and there we are. Um, so that's why these stocks rise to, to different levels. Uh, uh, we, uh, alternatively, if we have a, a very large rate of outflow from the stock, rate of outflow, like, you know, 0.9 or something like that, uh, the, the equilibrium value of the stock will be low. People will be leaving just as quick as they're coming in or almost as quick as they're coming in. And if we, if we have a very small rate of outflow out, a lot will be accumulating in the stock and that's the red. So you can think of this delay, the tau is sort of over what period of time the stock is accumulating its input. Um, or you can think of it in terms of with what delay is the outflow following the input. Those are, those are two good ways of, of um, remembering it. Just remember that first way, if we think about tau being over what period of time is the stock accumulating things, over a longer period will naturally mean a larger value of that stock. Um, so here's it shown, you know, in a, in a single graph for different, um, for, for I, don't, I don't know why it shows that the one on the right is the same each, each time. Um, uh, now, if the stock doesn't start empty, you know, initially we have zero inflow. It doesn't start empty. It'll be dragged down because there's zero inflow. We're draining off the stock and then inflow starts coming in. It will start moving towards the new equilibrium value. Okay. Um, stock at first has no inflow. And so the outflow shown here on the right will draw, be drawn towards the inflow zero the stock will be drawn down and then boom, the inflow starts coming in and the outflow will start gravitating towards it, okay? Um, okay, so just as a reminder, we have this negative uh, feedback associated with it and it's this surplus of inflow beyond outflow that's driving things. But we can think of fruitfully a uh, first order delay is having the situation where the outflow follows the input or where the value of the stock accumulates uh, the value of the input with a certain, for over a certain period of time as given by the delay associated with that stock, the tau. Okay, now I wanna introduce this notion of dimensions because it will follow us through the course. And there's some deep truths here that I don't have time to share with you today. Okay, um, like Fermat, I can't fit them into the margin of today's lecture. Um, so, um, but I'll, I'll hint as to them. Ladies and gentlemen, um, we have constructs that are useful to us uh, when, when dealing with the world of, of reasoning about um, the, the measure of quantities. You know, we can ask uh, how, 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 uh, okay, this is not good. You know, the, the length of this chopstick or of this uh, smartphone, or I could ask about the weight of this cliff bar or what have you. And we have units associated with those that allow us to compare, you know, this cliff bar with this uh, protein bar 
and and ask which of them you know packs more protein or what have you. Um, so we we have these ways of measuring quantities in the world and it's often useful when um, when we're thinking about quantities uh, and comparing them to, to mention these units. Uh, by operating in terms of these units, uh, we can clarify whether we're talking apple, comparing apples with apples, for example, or whether we're comparing, a, you know, a, the, the um, fuel efficiency of a car measured in miles per gallon with one that's measured in, uh, you know, uh, kilometers uh, per or liters per kilometer. Um, now, uh, when it comes to modeling, it's also extremely helpful to reason about the dimensions associated with the quantities we're dealing with in the model. And it can help us uh, equally much as in the, uh, the, the uh, practical day-to-day -day life make sure we're dealing with apples and apples. But, but more deeply, it can help prevent a model that's full of sound and fury, but signifies nothing of significance, where we're doing something utterly meaningless, like adding uh, a value that represents people to a value that represents dollars. Um, you know, 10 people plus $1 is not, you, you, you could say it's 11, but it's a meaningless construct. Um, Equally much so, we could be adding 10 people to two people per unit time, and that's meaningless as well. It, it does not have a well-defined uh, dimension. So it's, it's often um, extremely helpful for clarifying our thinking, for preventing errors, and ultimately for many other benefits, simplifying our models, uh, reducing the number of parameters to to, to be explicit about our uh, assumptions about um, the units or dimensions associated with quantities. Now I'm gonna use uh, those two terms in somewhat different ways in this course. So when I use the term dimension, I'm gonna be talking about a broad semantic category, like the length of something. So I might measure this chopstick in centimeters, in inches, but I could also choose to measure it in kilometers, or I could choose to measure it in parsecs, um, or indeed in microns. Uh, any of those is a unit of length. The length characterizes kind of what the, the semantic dimension is, or the, the, the semantic category associated with this. I'm measuring the length, or I'm measuring the, the weight of, of things, or, or, or I'm measuring the length of time, uh, for example, duration. Um, and, and we could speak about lengths, for example, without getting into particulars of what unit, what, what meter stick, as it were, I'm, I'm using to, to measure them. And a given quantity has a unique dimension associated with it. Um, and it's a foundational mistake if you're combining something of one dimension with another, say by adding them or subtracting them. It, it doesn't make sense to, you know, add something measured in, uh, in uh, square meters to something measured in meters as, as numeric quantities. Units will define, it will describe a particular reference or particular uh, uh, sort of reference uh, measure for, for characterizing a certain measurement of the quantities. So we'll talk about, for example, for time, seconds or weeks or centuries or microseconds. Um, uh, and those will all be with respect to the dimension of time. There are different units for measuring it or lengths might be measured again in inches or, or, or centimeters or, or meters or fathoms or, or um, furlongs or li or what have you. And that's, that's a measure of, of, of length, okay? Um, so units specify kind of our, what does one mean? If we give one unit of length, is it one day or one week or one year? Um, they tell us uh, sort of the, the corresponding uh, measure that, uh, that is to be used in interpreting that, okay? So units are specific uh, 
so when we speak about a set of units, it's typically with respect to a certain dimension. Uh, and uh, there's conversion quantities between units, right? You can compute uh, square feet from square meters uh, in a certain uh, fashion with, with, uh, with um, consistency. Or you could convert an inch into a centimeter, uh, 2.54 centimeters or what have you. Um, and a given quantity can be expressed in many units. Typically it has one dimension like time or people, you know, some, some count of people or a weight, but, but it can be expressed in many different units. Now, we won't get into it now, but it turns out that there's a profound truth about the universe. These are all really useful constructs for us to reason about, but it turns out there's a profound fact about the universe. The quantities which play out in the world and even socio-technical processes, processes that we're involved with, vaccinations, delivery of care and, and uh, treatment of, of those drawn ill for COVID or what have you, um, operating out there in the world, the world doesn't care about our unit system. The world couldn't care less about whether we measure things in furlongs or inches or centimeters. Um, it's gonna play out in the same way. Um, and that may sound trivial, but it actually tells us a deep truth. It says, any characterization of behavior in the world, any characterization of processes out there in the world, to be to, to be um, complete or be uh, uh, a, a, a an accurate characterization or a fulsome characterization, it needs to be able to be characterized without reference to dimensions or units, because the behavior of the world won't crash, believe it or not, if suddenly Canada were to, you know, retro or be taken over by the US and, and be forced into the hegemony of, of the imperial system of, of measuring, um, uh, measuring length uh, of larger size as miles instead of kilometers and uh, quantities with, uh, with inches rather than centimeters and your weights, uh, dear viewers, uh, with, uh, with pounds instead of kilograms. Um, it wouldn't, uh, the world wouldn't care, you know, uh, uh, in terms of the, the physical processes playing out there in the world. And what that's saying is that we should be able to build models of, of systems in the world without reference to units. There must be amenable to some characterization without reference to a unit, without reference to a dimension. And it turns out there's this class of quantities called the misnomer is dimensionless quantities. Uh, more correctly, they're called quantities of unit dimension, um, which, which basically can be expressed without reference to uh, to the the units involved. So it might be you know the fraction of this room in which I sit that's covered by furniture. Regardless of whether I characterize this room in terms of square meters or square feet or, or you know, square furlongs, um, that fraction covered is going to be the same. Uh, the fraction of a population who are sick with COVID is going to be the same, regardless of whether I count people in millions of people or, or on a per person basis. So there are these quantities called dimensionless quantities, which um, have a particularly profound place. But um, you know, many of our quantities are of that sort, uh, for example, probability, but many have units associated with them uh, and an associated dimension um, uh, with those units. So for example, we may have a, um, a hazard rate, a chance per unit time that someone progresses from a stop. Maybe it's due to death. Maybe it's due to recovery. Uh, maybe it's due to loss of immunity. Um, but if we have, uh, we characterize the rate at which they're doing it, say, uh, you know, one percent per day. The dimension is one over time, and the units might be one per year, one per day, one per second. 
uh, you could think of the one here. You may say, what the heck is that one? Well, you could think of it as like a probability per unit time of leaving or a fraction per unit time that leaves. When we have a fraction, when we say, you know, what's the fraction of this thermos that's filled with hot water right now? Um, that, that quantity is of unit dimension. So we denote it as one. It's, it, it doesn't matter whether I measure this, the, the capacity in liters or gallons or indeed cups, um, it, uh, it's going to be the same. And so we, we treat it as one, okay? Uh, it's uh, whatever units it has in the numerator and denominator cancel. Uh, if you know, if uh, you know, one liter worth out of the two liter capacity of this is filled, I mean, two liters, but uh, is, is filled, then the units cancel and uh, it, it's going to be the same regardless of whether I measure it in cups. So that's why we put it as, as one here, okay? Um, so uh, you could also read this as per unit time, you know, there's, uh, there's 20 percent of the, the group that leaves. Um, so here we, on other cases, we might have something like a length for distance, and we can, we can measure it in, in different particular ways. Okay. Um, uh, okay, so ladies and gentlemen, um, let's go back to first order delays. Um, dimensions and units will accompany us through the balance of the course. And if we're lucky, uh, we'll get a, a lecture or two uh, specifically on that purpose uh, that, that will, may uh, intrigue you further and expand on some of these points. But let's, let's talk about the problem at hand and let's talk about reasoning about the units to help us remember things, okay? Help us head off the chance of errors. Help us arrive at the right formulation when you're writing the exam. Okay, so here um, we could think of uh, units associated with uh, the stock person. Uh, maybe I'll just deal with dimensions. So this will be dimension person. Um, we'll deal with flows as being the dimension associated with the stocks into which they flow or out of which they flow divided by time. That's always the case. If you have a stock of dimension X, the flows into and out of it have to be of dimension X over time, okay? Um, because the stock integrates their values. The integral of that flow times DT, DT is measured in time. And so you're summing up things that ultimately are measured in terms of, uh, of uh, quantity per unit time times time and to give the, the, the quantity of the stock, okay? Um, now, in order for this to be the case, the flow to be, so the stock to be of, of dimension X, the flow to be of dimension X over time, well, the value of the flow is given by this mortality rate times the value of the stock. So the mortality rate here has to have the dimension one over time to multiply by population to get person over time. So when we're dealing with these dimensions, they multiply, they add, they divide, just like underlying quantities. So if we have one over time, times something that's a unit pop or something a dimension population, we'll get something uh, that's that's person per unit time. One over time times person becomes person per time. You, you multiply these dimensions, okay? Um, and it bears noting that all of this is very consistent. It, it, it fits together. Um, and if you ever forget what's the formula involving this, is it times it or is it divided by alpha? Is it population divided by alpha or times alpha? Just remember, okay, alpha is a rate. And so its, it's unit is one over time. And so that will tell me this has to be times it. But if we have a tau, a mean lifetime, its, it's dimension is time. This is number of days, say, they spend in ICU on average. And it has to be that the formula for the outflow 
is population divided by tau um, to get the correct units or the correct dimension here, person per time. It has to be, it's divided by tau, okay? For it, for it to be dimensionally consistent. We know the for a flow, its dimension needs to be the dimension of the stock into which whence it comes or whither it goes or both. And, and therefore it's associated that divided by time. And so therefore uh, this, if the formula for this flow is population divided by tau, tau has to have unit time. And notice that, that tau and alpha, the alpha here and the tau here are of reciprocal dimension. And that makes sense because one, in one case that the outflow is population divided by tau with the other it's times alpha. And, and so the dimension of one has to be the reciprocal of the other. And in fact, the numeric value of one is the, is, is the reciprocal of the numeric value of the other, okay? Okay, um, watching time here, we're gonna have to move quickly and live light on the land, okay? So um, there's a set of dense mathematics here. Um, it's, I shouldn't call it dense. It's, it's, it's a basic integral calculus, but basically what happens is um, that uh, we could characterize the flow rates um, uh, associated with a flow out of a stock according to some, um, some simple rules. Um, and here at any given, uh, any given small unit of time dt, the change in x or dx will be here if we have alpha times population as the outflow minus x times alpha or minus alpha x times dt for some small amount of dt, okay? And we said as x becomes depleted, the, the rate of change of, uh, or the, the change in x will become, become smaller, okay? Now, um, I think I'm gonna have to come back to this if, if time allows, but I wanna draw your attention to a couple things. The first thing is that um, when we are reasoning about this progression of a stock, we're reasoning about something that's a continuous system, okay? Um, and yet it's gonna be simulated beneath the covers in a fashion that's discrete, okay? And that's in fact, can be characterized by fixed time steps um, for, for the cases will be considered, which is called Euler integration after Leonhard Euler, the famous uh, 17th century, um, excuse me, uh, 18th century mathematician. Um, so uh, here we're going to have a, a fixed uh, delta t um, that we're going to use to sort of jump forward by delta t each time, computing uh, how the system evolves. Now, uh, we are doing that essentially leaping forward successively uh, through, through moments of time. And at each time point, we are going to complete uh, co compute the rate of change of the stock as dictated by the underlying mathematics. Um, and uh, we will be doing so according to uh, this sort of rule. So remember, the net flow into a stock, the inflows minus the outflows, gives the rate of change of that stock. In other words, it gives, if X is the value of the stock, dx dt, whether it's going up, you know, five people per day or dropping two people per day, it's a dx dt of five or minus two. Um, we can compute that from the net flow. That's dx dt is given by the net flow. We just sum up the flow in minus the flow out, okay? Um, and if we have a small time unit, dt here, or there will be written delta t with the sort of little triangle delta, a Greek letter. We can compute over the next little delta t, how much will the value of the stock, the change in 
the value of the stock X change? How much will it go up or here down? Okay. Um, so here we're sort of leaping forward over these changes, um, um, delta T. Okay. Um, so we're kind of leaping forward at each successive time point. We're computing the rate of change at that time point. And we are taking account, okay, how much is the value of the stock going to change over that next little bit and projecting it forward in a linear way? And then we go to that next time point and say, what, what's its rate of change there? We project that forward over the next little bit, okay? Um, and then we go to the next time point, compute its rate of change there. How do we compute the rate of change? Well, it's just the value of the inflows minus the outflows, okay? Um, and when we adjust the value of the stocks, we're just adjusting each stock's value, okay? Um, according to that inflow here, it's minus X times alpha times delta T. So maybe at time zero, for example, we have a, uh, we have, if we have alpha 0.2, this is the stock which began with a thousand people in it. It's a first order delay with delta T equal one. At time zero, we have initial stock value of a thousand. So the change in stock is, is minus 200. So that's 0.2 times a thousand times one. Great. So now we debit the stock. That's the de DX, right? We lower the value of the stock to 800. We're at time one now. What's the, how much does the stock go up or down in the next little bit? Well, it's, it has an outflow of rate of, rate of outflow, people per unit time of minus X times alpha, but delta T is actually one. So it's just, we could just compute that. So we have 800 people in the stock. Remember stocks dictate flow. So we have 800 people in the stock Alpha is 0.2, 800 times 0.2 is 160. And, and then times delta T is one. We, we have 160 people flowing out per next unit time. That brings us down to 640, okay? And we just continue in this sort of way. So for each of these sort of points in time, we're successfully computing the rate of flow. We are debiting it for how much we're going to lose in that next little bit and that, until that next time point, we're debiting it and it continuing on. Now, this is the simplest form of numerical integration. It's called the Euler integration. And uh, folks here may well have encountered it. I hope you've encountered it within uh, calculus class. But it, it bears noting here that um, this is only an approximation, okay? Um, we're assuming between these points where we compute it that the flow rate stays constant in that time. As I said, we're projecting linearly forward here each time. But if you notice, there's actually a little bit of a curvature here between each time point. But we're, we're treating it as a line. We're sort of projecting it forward, okay? Um, and uh, therefore, it's, a, it's an approximation. We're actually uh, not characterizing precisely numerically what's going on. And how good an approximation it is, forgive the English, but how good it is will depend on the value of delta t. Okay? Um, and so, for example, if we have a delta t of 0.5, we can simulate the value of the stock more precisely. And maybe by time five, for example, we, we will characterize here using the same rules, but with delta T here equal 0.5, we will play this out. And by time five, we would expect the stock to have value 348.7. Whereas before, by time five, we expected 327.68. So again, three, about 328 versus 349. Okay, that's a difference of, of, of over 20 there, okay? Um, so, so we could see that it has some, some uh, loss of, of precision. In fact, if we were to do a, a delta T of 0.25, we would find uh, a further approximation yet. And so step size as delta T actually makes a real difference. And I wanna draw your attention to something 
that we will presage the, the later two modules on agent-based modeling and discrete event simulation, because they use a very different approach. In those approaches, events happen as slowly or as frequently as needed, okay? Um, they, they, uh, some events might happen in a punctuated way really quickly. Some events are few and far between for periods. And we have no minimum step size, okay? Um, except zero, I suppose you could say. Um, so in general, we have to be aware that our, while we secure computational frugality, while we save computation time by having larger step size, we sacrifice some accuracy of the results. And in some cases, this can be very problematic. And I sketched this out in my, um, uh, on my uh, tablet here, but um, forgive the crudeness of this, but it's just showing the fact that maybe we have a, a you know, a, a exponential here, which, um, you know, is, is given by here minus uh, alpha times uh, T here. Um, and uh, if we want to simulate it numerically, we can do so, but Again, we're, if we're doing so on a very crude basis, we're only using the rate of change at, the, at these points to project forward. And if we do that crudely in blue, we, we, we might be quite far off from the actual value. We'll project down this very rapid decrease um, as applying over this entire time period, get down here and think the curve will be down here. And, and then we'll figure out what the rate of change is at this point and we'll project that forward in a linear way and be, be down here, but we're still quite far off from the curve. More troublingly yet, we might have an even cruder, even longer time frame uh, associated with, with this black line where we're not correcting till after it's too late. We've projected it down below the, the point where it, it hits this axis and it goes negative. And if you're simulating a population of people, that could be um, that could be problematic. Nobody likes being around negative people, but especially models don't like being around negative people. And and in general, if you're dealing with physical quantities, you'll start getting gobbledygook out of your models. And this is all caused by not by the mathematics, but by a injudicious choice of our computational characterization, ladies and gentlemen, of those mathematics, okay? We've, we've um, sought, we've flown like Icarus too close to the sun. We've sought to use too crude, a um, uh, too coarse, a time step and ended up, you know, uh, heading into the sea, okay? Plummeting like Icarus into the sea. Um, okay. Um, I had a bunch of mathematics here, which uh, uh, is, is uh, beautiful uh, as much as it is consequential, um, but I've shown in a derivation essentially that formally that the average length of time in a uh, first order delay uh, is, uh, so the average length of time you spend in that stock is one over the rate at which you leave the stock. So if you have a chance per unit time of say say 1% per day of leaving, your average number of days in that stock will be 100 days. If you have a, if you have a chance per day of 10% of leaving, 0.1, your average number of days in that stock will be one over 0.1 of 10. If you have a chance per leaving of 0.5 per day, 50% chance per leaving per day, well, it kind of stands to reason, right? You think kind of 50% leave the first day, 50% the second day, people on average should be there about two days. And indeed the, the mean is, is two days. Some people are there for longer, some people are there for less, or rather, since we don't distinguish particular people here, it's just a certain fraction of the population that's there for longer and a certain population that leaves before, before to, two time units. Um, so, so here, it turns out that there's this very nice relationship 
that uh, keeps to the basic integrity of being able to phrase things uh, easily in either average time in the stock, tau, or rate per unit time of leaving the stock, uh, alpha, um, per your choosing, or per the stakeholder's convenience for thinking about it, or per the data you get, you could frame it in either way. One is just the reciprocal of the other, just like their dimensions in a dimensional construct in a dimensional analysis context is one over the other the other dimension. Okay, so um, we have this uh, very nice interchangeability associated with the um, the formulations. Now, uh, in the closing moments, uh, and it really is closing moments here, I'm going to frame you two different ways of understanding first order delays, okay? Um, we've been operating with the lower one, a fixed, uh, an inflow, doesn't have to be fixed. Um, we have a, um, a delay uh, going out of it, for example, with the formula for the outflow being the formula stock divided by the delay, okay? It has to be that way. The delay is measured in time. Whatever the, the dimensions of stock are, the dimensions of the outflow or the dimensions of the stock divided by time. So it has to be, it's divided by delay, not multiplied by, it. the units won't make sense, okay? Um, if, if, if it were multiplied, it would be X times delay, which is not units X over, over time. Um, okay, now that's one way of formulating a first order delay. Here's another way up top. Here we have an X target. And this makes clear this whole idea of it's a follower, it's a, it's a delay, it makes it more explicit. And the formula here is look, the stock seeks a certain value. It, it gravitates to a certain value. It yearns for a certain value. And the value it, for which it yearns is the target. And the flow here is given by x target minus x2. So that's the, it should be more clear than that. It's the target, it's the gap between the target and the stock. So it's the target minus the stock, okay, divided by the delay. Now that, that gap can be negative. Mind the gap. Um, the gap is all what it's about. Um, so ladies and gentlemen here, if the target is greater than the value of the stock, if it's above it, this gap, X target minus the value of the stock will be positive. So the flow will flow into the stock, make the stock higher, bring it closer to the target. By contrast, if the target is smaller than the stock, the value of the stock, then we'll have X target minus X2 being negative, okay? The, the value of the, of the target is lower than the stock. So if we take the target and we subtract off the value of the stock, we'll get a negative quantity. And so that's gonna take value out of the stock, which you can do, and, and basically lower the value of the stock. Now, if the target is far, far, far above the stock, is far above the value of the stock, the flow will have, the formula for the flow will be very large in its numerator. And so the rate of flow into the stock will be much larger than if there's just a small piddling difference between them. If, if the target is equal to the value of the stock, this X target minus the value of the stock will be zero and the stock will remain unchanged. It's, it's on target. Um, if the value of the target is far below the value of the stock, it will grab a lot of flow out of the stock and lower the stock accordingly. Now you may say, wow, that's a very different formulation. But in fact, all you have to do, it's identically, identical mathematically. All you just say is the value of the, of the stock, I'm sorry, if the target is just equal to the equilibrium value of the stock. So it's delay times inflow. Remember that was the formula for the equilibrium when we formulated a first order delay in terms of a delay. Um, 
the, 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 the equilibrium value of the stock is delay times inflow. That's the value to which the stock gravitates. It gravitates towards the target. And so if we have a certain inflow and we want the stock's value to, to, to end up following uh, the value of, if we want the outflow to the, okay, I'm not, not formulating this well, but if we want the stock to follow a target dictated by the inflow, um, that target needs to be delay times inflow. And the stock will follow that in a way that its value will follow that target, okay? It will, it will uh, gravitate towards it. And it turns out it's, it's uh, an identical formulation here to the below. All we've done is we've smushed together the inflows and outflows, okay? So now we've, we've taken the inflow, combined it with the outflow into a single net flow. That's what the flow is here. It's a net flow, inflow minus outflow. And uh, that is uh, precisely shown here. And you can even look at it um, uh, just visually, right? Uh, so the outflow is X over delay. That's the value of the stock divided by delay. You can kind of see it in this part here. The value of the stock minus the delay is subtracted. But you say, well, what, what's this first thing? Well, look, it's X target divided by delay is, is added to it. But X target is just delay times inflow. So that's just inflow um, is, is, is X target divided by delay is just given by inflow. And that's the, the inflow component of this. So this formula is just the result of adding the inflow and the outflow, ladies and gentlemen. Okay. Um, so this is an alternative formulation that makes explicit the target following features of this situation. Okay. Um, uh, it, it's following this target here, we could think of it as, or it's, or the outflow is following the inflow um, and the stock has whatever value needed to, to, uh, to achieve that. The top of these is more a stock focused characterization, framing of first order delays. We're focused on the value of the stock and it achieving the value of the target. The bottom one is like a, an outflow centric version. We're focused on the outflow following the inflow. The outflow wants to be the same as the inflow. They're two sides of the same coin, ladies and gentlemen. Okay, um, so first order delays, summary. They're regulated by a negative feedback loop, so they tend to stability. The flow out involves a typically constant coefficient, which is phrased in one of two equivalent ways, either in terms of a, of a time constant tau or in terms of, uh, a, of a rate constant alpha, uh, chance per unit time of, of leaving. Um, and given a constant inflow, the, the equilibrium is tau times i, the amount of time you spend in there times the inflow kind of makes sense, right? If you have, if, if 10 people per day are coming into the ICU and your average time in the ICU is 21 days, then on average, you're going to have 10 times 21 people in there, 210 people in there on average, uh, because they're going to accumulate on average for 21 days. So it's I times tau. Alternatively, you could phrase it as I divided by alpha, this kind of, this uh, rate of progression alpha, okay? Um, now, uh, this could go in a number of different ways, uh, but we're gonna have to end here for today. I thank you for your patience, ladies and gentlemen. Um, this lecture is, as always, uh, followed by office hours, um, and I'd be delighted to uh, to, to have people uh, uh, have people join me at office hours in case I could answer any of the questions out of this fairly fast paced lecture. Okay. Um, I'm going to stop the recording now. Um, and